This is the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. They fought for us, now he'll fight for you. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cordaro Show on TV. And now, Bob Cordaro. Great. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. My name is Bob Cordaro, and this is The Bob Cordaro Show on TV. I'm a native of this region, born, raised, and returned twice. As many of you know, I do a radio show five days a week, 9 a.m. to noon on WILK. Appointment radio, we call it. And now we do this thing, The Bob Cordaro Show on TV, each and every week at 11.30 a.m. here on WNEP-TV 16. This show is devoted to the greatness of our area, Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. So we accentuate the positive, talking to people who make this area great. We don't tell each other that fact often enough, as well as talking to those who have or want connections to this area. Is it cheerleading? Yes, and we need more of it. In our health segment today, Dr. Brian France will continue our discussion of dental implants, a critical solution in the area of oral health, one that all of us should be aware of. Open wide. Then our Power Brunch Player of the Week this week is David DeCosmo, reporter emeritus for all of Northeast Pennsylvania. Born in Hazleton, David started as a kid in radio, moving on to TV, and in the process, becoming one of Pennsylvania's most trusted voices, covering stories large and small. From those with international impact, like the death of Mary Jo Kopechny, killed in an accident with then-Senator Edward M. Kennedy, to the Agnes Flood, the George Banks murders, Giardiasis, remember that? And more, he is the embodiment of the history of local news. So with the help of God, our families, and each other, let us begin. Dr. Brian France is an internationally recognized periodontist. He heads a multi-specialty dental practice in Dunmore and has consulted, lectured, and taught around the world in his chosen field. We've been talking to Dr. Brian France about the importance of implants and all subjects related to implants. Brian, what do you have for us today? Oh, good morning, Bob. Again, it's always good to spend Sunday morning with you. Indeed. So, uh, you know, we've been talking about dental implants and what a wonderful solution they are for teeth replacement. Uh, What I'd like the viewers to understand is that implants need to be done safely and correctly in order, you know, to assure that they, you know, last the patient a lifetime Mm -hmm. and that there's no complications. Uh, Fortunately, today we have wonderful technology uh, to allow us Uh, to place the implants and to restore the implants in a way that is safe and is long-lasting for the And your office is leading the charge technologically, regionally, and nationally, and even beyond. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Bob. We we have brought, our team has brought, uh, you know, technology to the area that that facilitates, you know, accurate placement of dental implants in a minimally invasive way and in a safe way. So I'd like to actually, uh, to that point, I'd like to actually show you a case that I did yes. uh, earlier this week. So if I could have the first uh, image, and this yes. is new technology actually, very new technology. So what you're looking at here uh, on this screen is this is called dynamic navigational surgery. Uh, this allows me to place the implant uh, in a way that I can actually see the surgery live. So it's almost like robotic surgery. So. If you look at the upper left-hand screen, you actually see my implant drill, and I'm following the trajectory of the intended implant placement. You can see the accuracy. I'm 2.3 degrees uh, from where you know zero would be perfect. So I'm off a little bit, uh, but certainly perfect. And in the middle screen, you'll see my drill actually entering into the bone. So the blue is the intended uh, implant that I'm going to place. The orange outline is the drill that's approaching. And in this case, we were trying to safely navigate and avoid the maxillary sinus. So I was able to drill exactly to the depth of the sinus in a, in, you know, in a very accurate way without invading the sinus or puncturing the sinus. And, um, and then go ahead and replace the dental implant. Uh, if I can have the second image, 
uh, we, I can show you. And this is actually what it looks like with the implant placed. You can see we had very little bone, but the end, and we were able to place a very nice long dental implant that will uh, support, uh, ultimately support a tooth in about four to six weeks. Yes, typically a, a case like this would have to be done uh, much more invasively, uh, entering the sinus a different way. So complicated cases like this, the, the technology that we have allows us to place implants in a minimally invasive way, very, very safe for our patients. It takes a lot of training to facilitate this type of advanced treatment and uh, implementation of It's, it's a, right. A plan. You're, you're, actually, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And, and in fact... Uh, to implement any type of technology uh, takes a lot of training, it takes capital investment, and it takes really you have to be, and I am, pretty, pretty stubborn to continue to train your staff and to train yourself and to stay up on everything so that things you know, are implemented successfully. And uh, I have more technology that you know, I'll, you know, as, the sh as we go on week after week, I'll be able to show you complete workflows in terms of not only how we place the implant surgically, which you've seen today, but also how we actually design, create, and produce the teeth in the office. Well, we started uh, with Dr. Brian France being awarded uh, the highest award that periodontists in the world can get. And I think we're starting to see why he received that award and was <laughs> the head of that organization. Yeah. Brian, thank you. My pleasure, Bob. Thank we'll you. We'll continue thank on this subject. We're looking forward to it. Thank All you. Right. Pat Sandone is a successful investment banker and entrepreneur who is president and founder of The Guide App, a health and wellness application you can use to guide your life. We're joined on our monthly segment by Pat Sandone, founder and president of The Guide App, a wellness application that's going to have incredible benefits to police, first responders, and eventually to everyone. Pat, we talked uh, last time about the gratefulness exercise, essentially, and I, I just found it fascinating how you compared it to physical exercise. And today you've got a, another segment of what the Guide app can do. Yes. It's great to be here, Bob. Congratulations on your... Uh, Baby, yeah. not your baby, but your son's baby. Your grandson. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the guide app, uh, one of the big principles in the guide app is that we can build a mental and emotional wellness by doing a daily practice, just like working out or taking a vitamin every day makes us healthier. We can build resilience, personal power, confidence by doing a daily mental and emotional wellness practice. The guide app offers thousands of different practices that are specially prescribed for your unique circumstances. And you can log in and spend five minutes every day doing these practices and build this over time. And today I'm gonna to talk about one of those practices, one of my personal favorites, and it's called Trusted Guide Journaling. So Trusted Guide Journaling is really interesting. I started doing this about three years ago. It helped me to reduce depression, reduce anxiety, and really helped me step into being my best self. I think actually without this particular exercise, I would not have had the courage and tenacity to persevere and start the guide app itself. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is they've done a lot of studies on this type of practice. It was started by a Swiss psychologist, very famous, called Carl Jung. Um, and it was, it's a form of voice dialogue. In one study, they found that 92% of the people who did this practice for 16 hours over eight weeks um, actually reduced or eliminated PTSD symptoms. Hmm. So it's really, really a powerful practice. But it, it's, it's something that takes a little bit to start. When I started doing it, it seemed weird. And then I got into it and the, the, the impacts were um, obviously profound. Uh, so the way that it works is it's like normal journaling where you, know, you're, you have your journal, you're writing, um, except you're actually talking to what they would call your inner self or the other side of your brain, um, which is something a lot of us don't know about. Um, 
So the way you do it is you take the journal or the phone, you put it on the right side to signify writing as yourself. Mm -hmm. You write your name, put a dash, and you ask a question. The first question you ask when you do this practice is, do I have a trusted guide? And if so, what's your name? And then you move it to the left, you write trusted guide, you put a dash, and then you just let whatever comes up flow into the journal, right? You don't think about it too hard, just let it flow. And it's amazing the things that have happened when I taught this to over 100 people, a lot of them first responders, veterans, um, people have broke down and cried. And people have had find immediate relief from some type of suffering they've had. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people that learn it once do it for a long period of time. Actually, everybody in our company does it. And your son, um, is this is one of his favorite practices as well. So it's, it's really profound. And then once you make that first foray, you go back to the other side, write your name, and just ask any question you want, something that in your life where you need a different uh, point of view. And then you move it back to the other side. And what's amazing is the voice that comes through, it's from you, but it's not the way you would normally think about the situation. So you get a new perspective, which can often change your approach. And that new possibility that it creates can make a world of difference. And the key to this is the guide app, which directs you in this practice. That's right. You can learn it through the guide app. The guide app has micro learning courses um, and you go through and you can learn this, this practice in probably about 10 minutes. Um, and it's also inside the app. We have a moderated peer support group with uh, guide employees moderating it. If you have questions, you can ask them. It, it all happens inside of the app, as well as thousands of other practices just like this that can make profound benef uh, benefits for people in just five minutes a day. Great stuff. Guide app. Yes. At Sandome. Great to be here. Great to be with you as always. All right. Thanks. And now, the Sunday Brunch Power Player of the Week on the Bob Cordaro Show. Well, my old friend David DeCosmo joins me today. He's our Power Brunch Player of the Week. And, uh, he He's a gem. He's a classic. And he's an icon. And I'm just so pleased to have you, David DeCosmo. Thank you for joining us. Well, I'm thrilled to be here, Bob. And, and I guess this is uh, uh, tit for tat. I used to interview you all the time. <laughs> and now it's your turn yeah, uh, yeah. To, to do the interview. <laughs> well, uh, so David DeCosmo, you, you're born Hazleton. Yes, yes. And at some point you decide you want to get into the media business. You want to be behind the mic, eventually television, but behind the mic. Yes, I, I, uh, I grew up listening to radio. You know, the, the television set wasn't our centerpiece. It was a radio in the 40s. Our f television came along probably in the 50s for me. And I loved the old radio programs. And I wanted to be a radio announcer. Uh, that started for me as an errand boy at the local radio station uh, for a few months. And then I became- Because Hazelden had its own station at the time. WACL AZL. was there, and I was an errand boy there. And then we had a new station come How to town. How old are you? How old am I now? At, no, at that oh, time. Oh, at that time, 15. Wow. 15. And uh, another station came into town, and the man who managed it had been my dad's manager at the Capitol Movie Theater. And he asked me if I'd like to be a janitor there. $15 a week. And I came in, it was a daytime station, and uh, I'd clean the whole place. Yeah. And then it shut down for the night, and I would go in and I'd play with the control board. Somebody got sick. I was the only other person that knew how to work the control board. So I got on the air, and I, I did what I really loved most. I was a disc jockey. Yeah. Uh, and uh, What kind of music? Rock. Rock, and some easy listening to. I had a show called Dinner with Dave. How, uh, all right, so time frame, what? what we're talking know? 1959, 1960, 61, okay. 62. Oh, great music. Uh, yeah, e eventually, though, uh, I, I lost a job in the area, and the only opening was at WILK, and it was a news opening. And I was not interested in news, really, other than reading it. Uh, the boss's son was my news director. An old friend of mine who helped me get it, get into radio, uh, Bill Schmier, who had ever only ever moved once, was the second in command. So I came on, I figured I'd take it temporarily till a DJ job came along. A DJ job came along within one week, and I thought to myself, I cannot take a job and leave it in one week. 
It'll look terrible. Mm -hmm. I've got to stay. I've got to stay. One year later, the boss's son and Bill were gone, and I was the news director. And then along came a lady named Agnes, the Agnes Flood. And uh, I, I think you know the history of yeah. that. I became the voice of civil defense. I told everybody to get out of their homes. <laughs> I didn't make that decision. I just passed it along. But uh, radio then led into television. So, I mean, radio's halcyon days, particularly in terms of news, was, was the 50s, the 60s. Yes. And that's waning in the 70s. And David Cosmo has got a substantial reputation in the radio business. He's going to make a leap to television now. And what year is that? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Um, during the Agnes flood, I was called into Channel 16 by the owner, Tom Shelburne. The news director, uh, Bob Carroll, was sick. He got sick working with the National Guard. He wanted me to take over as news director. My radio station was off the air. I came in. I spent one day at Channel 16 as news director. Came to him that evening and said, Mr. Shelburne, there is no one in this building, including the janitor, that doesn't know more about television than me. Mm -hmm. And I said, my radio station will be coming back on the air. Thanks, but no thanks. So I was in television part time for several years. And then in 1980, I took over uh, as the Wilkes-Barre bureau chief for Channel 22. And of course, eventually 22 and 28 had a combined uh, presence. And so for the last few years, I worked for both of them. And, and 1980, there was still substantial resources being put into television news. Yes. The, the, the technology that has changed during my tenure, during my career, I've been in the media well over 60 years. Technology has just taken over everything. But it has me concerned, too. When I went and gathered a story, whether it be at the county level, wherever it was, I got whatever facts were presented to me or what information was presented to me as facts. If there was an opposing point of view, I sought it out and got it. Mm -hmm. And I just delivered what was given to me. But I knew what I was delivering. Today, I see far too many reporters beginning a newscast by pulling out a smartphone and reading from that phone. So they are reading a story to me. They're not telling me a story. A newsman is a storyteller. Often it's a, it's a bad story. It's, it's yeah. a hard story. Cronkite said that news was like watching white linen coming off of a, an assembly line. If you see a black spot, you're a reporter. Your job is to tell people about that black spot. If you're an editorialist, you may suggest ways to remove that black spot. And we hear a lot about there should be more good news. Well, if you're coming home from a ceremony where somebody just got a, a Boy Scout was elevated to Eagle Scout, that's fine. It's a wonderful thing. It should be known. But if on your way home, you notice five blocks from your house, flames ripping into the air and heavy smoke, you're going to turn on your television. And I don't think you're going to seek out the news about the Boy Scout. You want to know what that fire was all about. So by its nature, news looks for the black spot. Yeah. And that's our job. That was my job. <laughs> yeah. Well, David, you saw so many things. You, you were involved on a national level on a number of stories. I want to go to the, the, to the Mary Jo Kopechny story. Yes. Because that was really a hallmark for you, I think, well, I, among, I, among many. Uh, yeah, well, of course, Mary Jo was from Luzerne County. She died in the car driven by Senator Ted Kennedy that plunged into the bridge off of Chappaquiddick Island. And, of course, he didn't report it until the next morning. He swam back. By the way, I've seen the ferry boat and I've seen Chappaquiddick. I could swim across. It's mm -hmm. not that far. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, Mary Jo— Especially jo now that you use that treadmill every day. <laughs> now that I use the treadmill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Mary Jo was buried in Plymouth Township outside of Wilkes-Barre. She was buried without an autopsy. Uh, the uh, medical examiner on the island said she drowned. The scuba diver who recovered her body said, no, she died of asphyxiation. She was in an air pocket until so the air ran out. ran out. We didn't know that for sure. And so the district attorney for the Southern District of Massachusetts, Edmund Denise, came to Luzerne County and petitioned the court to exhume her body. 
parents opposed the exhumation. The key to the case was evidence given by people on the island versus the speech by Senator Ted Kennedy that he gave to the nation. For some reason, uh, network TV would not give them uh, a recording of his speech. And as we were leaving the courthouse for lunch one day, I said to the district attorney's assistant, you guys are always thinking about television. You never think about radio. He said, you mean that was on radio? I said, certainly it was. He said, do you have it? I said, no. He said, can you get it? I said, I think I can. I called WBZ in Boston, explained the situation. They played the tape for me. I recorded it back at WILK. Had to come back to the courtroom because it was still recording while I, mm -hmm. while the session was coming back in. In the middle of the session, the secretary comes to Judge Berminsky and whispers in his ear. And the next thing I know, he said, why don't you take a moment here? David, would you come up here? All of a sudden, I'm being sketched by artists from mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, and he said, what's this about a tape they brought to me? I said, they weren't supposed to bring it to you. They were supposed to bring it to me. District Attorney Denise found out I had the tape. And he said, and this is a quote, you are my ninth inning home run. I don't think I'm going to have to call you to the stand. Unfortunately, the uh, attorney for the Kopechny family didn't agree, and they did call me to the stand. Mm. And if you could see my knees behind that, uh, <laughs> that podium, they were shaking. And this is literally a national, international audience. This is, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I, I, uh, they asked me, uh, did you edit the tape? I said, no. They said, did WBZ? I said, I have no knowledge of that. And they said, well, we move it not be admitted, admissible because it may have been edited. And the judge said, if you can prove it was edited, it won't go. Otherwise, it does. And so I spent 20 minutes playing Senator Kennedy's speech on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder uh, to the group. Now, ultimately, the judge felt there was no outstanding uh, evidence of criminality. And due to the parents' wishes that they were opposed to the exhumation, he ruled in their favor. I was told later in life that the parents had other thoughts about that later on, but Changes it was too late at that point. Let's talk about a, another major story. There's two I have in mind, but, but one is the Agnes flood. And I have you on every year on yes. my radio <laughs> program to talk about the Agnes flood. Uh, it's like being there, having you with, with <laughs> me. And, that had to be the scope of that, the magnitude of that. Again, it, another international story. It was probably one of the stories I did that had the most lasting uh, consequences, although there's one other. But uh, that one, we had a two-way radio at the county courthouse. And I thought as the danger of a flood became more and more apparent, it would be more logical to go to the courthouse and call reports back instead of calling them all the time. But when I got there, I found out that their public relations man, their public information officer didn't show up. And I was literally drafted <laughs> with the OK of my boss at the radio station. And uh, I wound up putting together, uh, thanks to an old colleague, Ron, Ron Jay in Hazleton, a 13 uh, station network of radio stations that broadcast flood information once an hour. I guess we're in for about two weeks or so, so that... We knew that the information coming was okayed by the authorities, uh, so we prevented uh, fake news. Yeah. Sometimes a station would get a tip from somebody, they just go on the air with it. Well, in the case of uh, the community of Plymouth, uh, somebody said there was a break in the dike. There wasn't at that point. And, uh, you know, people in Plymouth could have been panicking right then. Yeah. Now, civil defense could say, no, that's not true. We know that. We've sent people there. So it was important to have a reliable source. And civil defense was the reliable source. I happened to be their voice. So I didn't make decisions. I wasn't, yeah. I, I didn't say everybody has to leave their home now because I thought so. But it goes along with the old television show, You Are There. <laughs> yes, that's yes, that's, that's true. David, One other thing, very quickly, the other thing was very big and I had almost forgotten it. I got a tip. And it was from a great source, and I went with it. And two days before anybody else, I revealed that our area had been hit by geodiasis. Well, that led to people boiling their water throughout this area, filtration plants that have raised the cost of water. And it's a story that is, you know, almost forgotten. And the defeat of a congressman. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The first man I ever taped 
as an errand boy at WAZL was Congressman Dan Flood. Yeah. And uh, you, you know, when you're taping, you have a meter, a little meter, looks like a speedometer, and you're supposed to keep that meter right at a certain point. <laughs> Dan Flood <laughs> was a man whose voice could raise up very strongly <laughs> and then go down rather softly. But I got it done. <laughs> he was a thespian. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. What a man. David, there's never, there's not enough time to, you, we, we can do hours, and we will, by the way, on the radio again. Um, sort of summarize, if you could, with, we have a minute or so left. Summarize your thoughts on the media, your place in it. I, I'm, I'm, my place is, is in historical terms now. I did what I did. I have no uh, qualms about what I did. I had never had anybody ask me to do a story a certain way. Never. Salesmen might ask you to do something on a place opening. I'd say, if we can show there's jobs involved, I'll mm -hmm. do it. Um, today, unfortunately, we've lost radio. Uh, radio news is not there anymore. Very, very small. A couple stations here and there. Uh, those People coming into radio now or coming into television now are coming from school. Sometimes they're being taught by people who have never been in the field. Yeah. This troubles me a we lot. We have a young guy we want to get in. Yeah, so this is, uh, grandson, come on Anthony. over here, buddy. This is, this is my, my love. This is one of our grandkids. This is Anthony David DeCosmo. And uh, he's actually helped me in some of my daily blogs that I do on Facebook. Yeah, I uh, love the daily blog. Yeah. And All I, right, so David, with the seconds we have left, Let's have you and Anthony sign off. All right, Bob, we will do that. I'm David DeCosmo. This is Anthony DeCosmo. We hope all your news is good. <laughs> Thank you, David. Great pleasure. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> pleasure to be here. Yeah. Anthony. <laughs> Your Sunday Brunch Power Player of the Week on the Bob Cordaro Show. Join us every week for the Sunday Brunch Power Player of the Week. I could talk to David DeCosmo, and by the way, I have for hours. His knowledge of local history and media, and that's why I have him on my radio show so often. His first-person observations of the major stories in history here in Northeast and Central Pennsylvania are without parallel. They, they truly are. And then Dr. France with the implant thing, I mean, that's a big deal. And bringing this kind of world-class technology here, it's one of the things that maybe people don't know about. So big stuff this week. And Pat Sandon, world-class business guy, and the Guide app is going places, and it's going to help a lot of people. Great show today. So happy to be with us. Join me every Sunday, 1130 a.m. here on WNEP-TV 16, The Bob Cadaro Show. Thanks for being part of the program. You've got an appointment every Sunday morning at 1130 right here on WNEP-TV. They fought for the us, Bob now he'll Show fight for you. On TV. The pursuit of justice and liberty. It's the Bob Cadaro Show.